Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, just to make sure that we stay on task, I'm going to record a series of lectures uh, that you can review for chapter 14. So as many of you know, I am an epidemiologist, so we're going to go through this chapter with a very practical application. Also, as you remember, there is an epidemiology unit in your formal paper. So I will be going over key areas that you are going to want to highlight in your descriptive and analytic epidemiology sections. So let's get started. So first we have to talk about pathology, infection, and disease. So pathology is the study of the disease itself. It's natural history. So how long before you're exposed do you get symptoms? What is the percentage of people who actually get symptoms? What do the symptoms and signs look like? Symptoms are generic things that you can't really measure, like pain, fatigue, um, aches, things of that nature, whereas signs are things like fever or rash, things that can be objectively measured. So each disease has its own thumbprint, where the pathology is very, very unique to that specific illness. Whereas the etiology, on the other hand, is the cause of the disease. So for infectious diseases, we are looking at things like um, a, an infectious agent, a virus, a, a parasite, a prion, something that is leading to the specific signs and symptoms. Now, if any of you have ever Googled anything, you know that uh, Google is kind of your worst enemy. What I mean by that is you are going to uh, say, you know, I have a fever, um, I have a rash, and it's going to say, you know, you have... Kreutzfeldt Jakob's disease, or you have uh, Lyme disease, or it's just going to jump all over the place. But looking at the specific pathology, looking at the risk factors, which we're going to talk about uh, later in the lecture, um, and understanding the etiologies or the sources of each one of the different infectious diseases that we're talking about this term um, can help. And remember, most of these diseases, we didn't start out knowing what the cause was. And it's through epidemiologic investigation and microbiological assessment later, because epidemiology came first before we had germ theory. Pathogenesis is, again, that natural history. Well, whereas patho pathology itself is more the signs and the symptoms of the disease, pathogenesis is the development. And that can be very predictive. And what I mean by that is... Um, for example, if you were to look at uh, a disease like German measles versus regular measles, German measles, the body rash starts through, you know, starts throughout the torso, whereas with traditional or regular measles, the rash starts at the eyes and then moves throughout the body. So knowing that developmental difference will help you be able to determine whether you're dealing with German measles or regular measles, right? Infection is the actual invasion or colonization. So you have, again, three types of organisms. You have those organisms that are commensal, that they're not going to cause you um, any negative consequence. Commensal meaning literally eating at the same table. You have those who are opportunistic, uh, these are peop uh, people, these are organisms that will not necessarily harm you unless uh, there is a break in your skin or there's, um, uh, you know, you're on antibiotics, which causes your normal microflora, which are keeping them in check normally uh, to go away and then they can take over. Uh, they're not going to be true pathogens. They're just going to wait for the host to have some type of other disease or immunocompromising condition. And then there's the true pathogen. And these, you know, actually do cause the disease uh, that we're, we're looking at. So what is a disease? So a disease is any abnormal state in which the body is not performing the functions as intended. Okay, so um, we're not going to get into the political nature of diseases when we're talking about like chronic diseases, obesity, uh, body dysmorphia, all those other things in which people are claiming are not a traditional disease. But for in this case, we're looking at um, significant signs and symptoms that deviate from the normal 
level of what we anticipate for the body. So for example, 98.7 degrees, a relatively normal body temperature. As we deviate above that, you know, that is indicative of some, usually some type of viral or bacterial infection. A rash. In traditional functioning of the body, you should not see a rash, right? So the body should not naturally perform a rash. Thus, when you're investigating a disease state, you have to assess the rash. So that is a disease state. Normal microbiota. So this, a lot of research is going on about what constitutes this. And you have different solutions with taking probiotics and establishing your microbiota. Um, transient microbiota may be present for weeks, days, or months. Um, these you may pick because you visited a, a farm or you went to a new country or a different region within your country and you just picked up organisms that are native to that area that you did not have. But as you distance yourself from that exposure, so you get back from your vacation or you, you no longer are in that area or occupation, those, those microbiota will be outcompeted or quelled by your own natural microflora uh, or microbiota. Normal microbiota. These are your, you know, basic organisms that are living on you and in you. Uh, they do not cause uh, con uh, disease under normal conditions. And in fact, more and more research that we're discovering, they're preventing you from getting a lot of true pathogens. And they're making sure that the opportunistic pathogens uh, do not, you know, take over. So let's talk a little bit about one example of a, an opportunistic pathogen. You have something like uh, Staphylococcus aureus. So Staphylococcus is very interesting. Uh, Staphylococcus um, is in about 30% of people and it's susceptible to antibiotic state, but it doesn't cause illness in these people. However, let's say somebody cut themselves shaving um, and then they developed a huge abscess or pustule on their chin. That could be the result of, you know, that abrasion to the skin, compromising the situation and staff going, ooh, I like this, and then replicating out of control, causing a disease state. Now, the current research is really trying to push to find what is the ideal human microbiome. So there's a lot of research that's going on that's saying, well, these are unhealthy gut flora. These are organisms that are not indicative of optimal functioning. And we're trying to really discover what that ideal mixture is. So this is looking at uh, several organisms. Uh, you can see bacteria. You can see the orange fears on the surface of the nasal epithelium. This is most likely Staph aureus as uh, Staph uh, colonizes the nares of the nose. We see the bacteria on the lining of the stomach. Okay. And we see bacteria in the small intestine, right? These are varying levels of colonization. Not necessarily all of them are in a disease state. Look at the cilia. The cilia uh, in the nose are allowing to, you know, flourish. The staph is not causing them any deleterious side effect. So again, normal microbiome. Distribution and composition of the microbiota are determined by many factors. If you have a poor diet, um, you rely on convenience food or fast food, uh, what you will notice is your microbiomes, um, it will change. That is why, or one of many reasons why, if you take a vegetarian or vegan and you give them meat, uh, there is a physical discomfort associated with it. One, they're not used to producing the enzymes in the quantity that they need. Two, their microbiome aren't populated with organisms that easily break down those proteins. Um, there are physical and chemical factors of a given individual that would promote or dissuade certain organisms. So, for example, uh, women, the acidity of the vagina prevents fungal growth, specifically yeast. So, if you have a more basic or um, 
a basic vagina, then what happens is you are more prone to yeast infections because the acidity is not right. And that's why in many probiotics you have lactobacilli because if you get more exposed to more lactobacilli, that raises the acidity, generally fighting off those organisms. Then you have host defenses. So how active is your immune system? If your immune system is very active, uh, then your host system might quell or fight off the good bacteria. If your immune system is not so active, well, the microbiome can't do it on its own. So what's going to happen? You might be more prone to infection. And there are mechanical factors, which are many, such as presence or absence of hair, um, uh, frequency of washing, etc., etc. So relationship between the normal microbiota and the host. So there is this microbial antagonism, which is a competition between microbes. So normal microbiota protect the host by competing for nutrients, right? Providing those pathogens don't have enough nutrients to grow, or those opportunists don't have enough nutrients to grow out of control. Producing substances harmful to invading microbiomes. Again, lactobacilli, the best example here. Reducing the pH. Um, or producing antimicrobial substances. And again, in the third example, influencing pH and availability of oxygen resulting in a decrease of the pathogenic microorganisms. So as we're looking at these microorganisms, we have several different classifications. We have symbiosis, which looks at the normal microbiome and the host. Symbiosis commensalism, so that means that the organisms and the host are working together for the health of the organism. So we started to explore this with some, um, we called them knockout mice at UC Davis. And these knockout mice have absolutely no microbiota in them. They are completely sterile. And what we noticed is when a living organism doesn't have any bacteria on it, uh, specifically commensal bacteria, um, they can't make use of the nutrients in their food. So these mice were chronically underweight and had to consume about two to three times more than the mice that had the bacteria. Okay. Uh, mutualism, uh, both organisms benefit. The best example here is uh, the bacteria that produce vitamin K and some vitamin B in the gut as a result of um, the organism or the us eating, the organism takes a little bit of energy and makes some uh, vitamins for us. Parasitism. So this is, again, one organism benefiting at the expense of another. So what we notice, like when we start talking about parasitic worms, is some of the parasitic worms take a while, right? So you have to have multiple parasitic worms. So if you just have one or two Ascaris, they're commensal right? They're not really doing anything. Um, they're kind of just sitting there eating off your food, uh, not really causing detriment to you. Uh, but if you get over 20, you start to experience issues or problems. So these are some classic examples. Um, commensal, staph on, on skin, it's not really doing a huge problem. Uh, e. coli in the gut, which can help synthesize uh, some vitamins, so both organisms benefit, and parasites, H1N1, by definition, all viruses are some type of parasite.